Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Very, very, very weird history today. (laughs) We have a Halloween in July episode, and part of me wishes I would have kept this topic back and saved it for October, but uh, when I learned about the dead Pope trial, I had to tell as many people as possible, um, as soon as I possibly could. And I'm so glad that you're here so I can fill your brain with the ridiculousness that is the following events. (laughs) Maybe you're thinking, TK, she must be exaggerating a little bit, right? Right? This must be a tad bit clickbaity. The Catholic Church can't possibly have dug up a dead pope and put him on trial, right? Wrong. But at the risk of spoiling the entire episode in the intro, let me do a little housekeeping before we get into the topic. So first, I highly encourage you to check out the new and improved For the Love of History Patreon. There's lots of fun new extra content on there. There's a monthly sleepy history and all sorts of fun little goodies on there. And membership starts as low as $2 a month. So... Uh, that would be great if you joined us over there. But if that's not your thing, that's totally okay. I would also super appreciate a rating or a view. Uh, They make me happy cry and they appease the algorithm gods, which is very important. Support in any way is greatly appreciated. And so with that out of the way, please grab your most catholicly catholic (laughs) e-chalice worthy of a pope fill it with your favorite beverage buckle on in because it's going to be a wild ride and let's get to it the following events might be the most catholic churchy happenings to ever catholic church in the Catholic Church. I grew up Catholic Catholic and did did the the whole confirmation confirmation classes. I did the baptism. I chose my patron saint, which was Joan of Arc, by the way. We did Midnight Mass. We did Palm Sunday. We did Ash Wednesday. We did all of the things, all of the Catholic things. And I even went to the Vatican and had my rosary blessed by the Pope. At least that's uh, what the guy at the gift shop at St. Peter's Basilica said. And I have always been fascinated with how absolutely extra the Catholic Church is between the stained glass windows, the relics, the gold-plated everything, and the Pope's wardrobe that probably is worth more than any A-list celebrity in Hollywood right now. The Catholic Church, in my opinion, is nothing if not a giant pageant show all the time. And of course, of course, we can't talk about the Catholic Church without talking about its dark side as well. While the Catholic Church has its Met Gala worthy pageantry, it also has a very dark history that can be bone chilling and often atrocious. Some of the most garbagey garbage humans to ever conduct their garbage human business have done so under the name of the Catholic Church. And now I have not been a practicing Catholic since university and in this episode I'm not here to say that the Catholic Church is the worst thing in the entire world or the best nor am I here to lay judgment on the Catholic Church as a whole but what I am here to do is give the most bombastic side eye and heavily judge the events and the people in our topic today which is one of the most ludicrous happenings in the big big book of history so Let me set the scene. The year is 872. The Catholic Church has been around for like four or five hundred-ish years, and it was about to enter into the Hunger Games of (laughs) popiness. Now, if you're not familiar, the Pope is the dude that is elected to talk to God via the prayer hotline and make decisions for the church on faith and morality and all that other fun stuff. And the Popes. Oh, the Popes between 872 and 965 were wild. Twas chaos and calamity and jealousy and greed that created this Pope-eat-Pope world of the late 800s and 900s. 24 popes were crowned in Rome during this time, and between the years 896 and 904, there was basically a new pope every single year. And I hear you asking, TK. 
what is going on? A lot. A lot, my friend. So, here's what happened. The Catholic Church and the Italian Peninsula and its political families, particularly the Spoletos, were like BFFs. The Spoletos had vouched for the church and protected the church and in return, the Pope and all his dudes got tangled up in the political shitstorm that was the ninth century in Italy. These popes and bishops and deacons would take sides of these powerful families to gain power and money and status, and this left them open to poisoning, arrest, blackmail, assassinations, and uh, a short life expectancy, to say the least. And thus, new popes were popping up all the time. We're not going to go into the specifics of these extremely complicated, complex political fights because that would take an eternity and it's not really super important to our story. Just know that because of the alliances that were made between these families and different church members, there was a lot of jealousy and conspiracy among the clergy. Lots of bad blood, lots of backstabbing, not a great time. And one bishop in particular, the star of our story today, Bishop Formosa, found himself entangled in this complex political battlefield that would cost him his life and his afterlife. Formosus. Oh, oh, Formosus. His name is really fun to say, but that's, that's about where the fun ends. In the late 800s, Formosus was the Bishop of Porto, and he would go on a ton of diplomatic missions in the name of the papacy, which just means in the name of the Pope. Like, it's a fancy way to say in the name of the Pope. So the Pope would be like, hey, Formosi, can you head on over to like Bulgaria or Constantinople? And Formosus would be like, yeah, sure, sure thing, boss. Let me head on over. Not a big deal. He was having a grand time. He was doing great, doing the Lord's work, literally. <laughs> and while on these papal journeys, Formosa got very cozy with a man named Arnulf of Carinthia. And he was a Frankish king. And uh, old Arnulf really, really wanted to be the king of Italy, like real bad. He had a lot of people. He had a lot of power. He had a lot of land so this wasn't a pipe dream it was definitely doable for him and when pope john the eighth the current pope found out that formosus was getting all friendly and buddy buddy with arnolf he was pissed because arnolf's power was just too much and if he became king of italy the catholic church would lose its independence and also the catholic church was already supporting another family remember remember the spoletos yes Arnulf was not a part of the Spoleto fam, so it was a big no-no. And Formosus knew this. He was definitely trying to stir the pot. So Pope John VIII had to call Bishop Formosus back to Rome and be like, my guy, I'm going to have to have you excommunicated because this is just not cool. You're like, you're messing everything up. You know we can't be supporting that Arnolf dude because we support the other family, right? You know this, right? So basically now I have evidence that you're like trying to usurp me as the Pope because you want power. That's not cool. You got a GTFO, my guy. So from Osas and his followers, GTFO. And they laid low for a few years until 882 when Pope John VIII was assassinated. Yes, he was assassinated. And he was the first pope to ever be assassinated, ever. Which, I don't know if that is something that you want to be the first to have happen to you. Does not sound fun. And another not-so-fun first is he's the first pope to die uh, in our long line of popes that will die in this episode. So after Pope John VIII was assassinated, a new pope was elected, and this was Pope Marinus I. And Marinus was like kind of a chill guy, and he said, listen, Formosas, like I don't think you're a bad dude. Come on back. Come back to Rome, and we can be one big happy family again. It's not a big deal. I forgive you. You're un- 
excommunicated. You're re-communicated. <laughs> so Formosa came back and took his position as the head of his former diocese in Porto. And P.S. and by the way, diocese is just like a district under the control of a bishop. I didn't know what it meant and I've heard it over and over again. So I looked it up and I thought you might be the same. So yeah, diocese, just an area controlled by bishop. <laughs> okay, back to the story. So one year after becoming Pope, Marinus I dies. Now we're not sure if he was assassinated or if he died of like natural causes. It doesn't really say. All we know is that he's dead. And Pope Adrian II would be the Pope that comes after him. And he is Pope for again like over a year and then dies while he is on his way to a place called Worms. <laughs> He dies on his way to a place called Worms, which is now in present day Germany. And why? Why would you name a town Worms? Did Was there no meeting? Did nobody like check that and be like, you know what? Maybe we could name it like Trees, something, I don't know, better than the city of Worms. Anyways, I digress. Uh, Adrian II dies and we get a new pope, Stephen V, who again dies but like after five years of being the pope so he like he really stuck it out good job Stephen v and i'm sure you're wondering where our friend formosus is where is that guy that pesky little fella don't you worry my delicious little donut formosi wosi is laying low making friends and biding his time for his big plans get ready for it because when pope Stephen the fifth dies. Formosus becomes the Pope. What? I know. Did you see that coming? I didn't see that coming. He became the Pope. Well, no, you definitely saw that coming because the, uh, the title of the episode is The Dead Pope. <laughs> I didn't see it coming when I was doing my research. All right. That's what I was try I'm trying to say. But I digress. From rags to riches, from exiled bishop to Pope the top of the Catholic Church. Bananas. Good for you, Formosus. However, not everything was all holy wafers and wine. It was not. And like any handover of power, the new leader almost always inherits kind of a shit situation. A not good thing. And boy, was Formosi in a pickle. You see, Stephen, right? Stephen V and most of Rome to be honest, had been besties with Guy III of the Spotello family, right? And he had become the king of Italy. And kings of Italy have to go to Rome to get like the stamp of approval by the Pope, okay? And he was on his way to Rome for Pope Stephen V to crown him Holy Roman Emperor. But Stephen is dead. Stephen died. And for Moses did not like Guy III. They were not vibing. They were not on the same level. Guy was super sus, apparently. And Formosa was like, listen, I'm going to call my old friend. I'm going to call my friend Arnolf and have him come confront Guy III because I'm Pope and I can do that. And I'm friends with Arnolf and Arnolf is super powerful. And if he becomes king of Italy, I'll be more powerful. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Formosus did that evil laugh, but I hope he did. <laughs> so the year is 893. Arnolf gets the call from Formosus. Formosus is like, come on. Arnolf is like, yes, I'm on my way. He rolls up to Milan and Pavia and just kicks him ass. And he makes his way across the land to get rid of Guy III and to like assert his dominance as potentially, fingers crossed, the future king of Italy. And this takes him some time. It's the 800. So, you know, going from point A to point B is not very straightforward. <laughs> so while Arnolf is on his way to Rome, Guy III has the audacity to die. What is going on? Why are people dying all just dropping like flies during this time period? Dropping like flies. So Guy III dies. What happens? Well, Guy III has a son. His son's name is Lambert. And Lambert is crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And Arnulf catches word of this and he's like, WTF? What is going on? I'm on my way 
to to Rome right now because you, Formosa, said that I, I could be king, right? So Arnolf goes <laughs> to Rome, just lays siege on Rome because he's pissed. And Formosa is like, wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I'll name you king of the Holy Roman Empire if you let me out. Like, I know you're like sieging or whatever, but just like, let me out. And Arnolf is like, all right, that's all I wanted in the first place. Just like, make me king of Italy and I'll get out of your hair and you can be Pope still. So Formosus crowns Arnolf and Arnolf is happy. And a few months later, Formosus dies. How many is that now? How many people do we have dead? That's at least six. At least six. I've ne- We've never had so many people die in one episode. Good, good gracious. Okay, anyways, can, so, Formosus is dead. Some people say that it was an assassination because they were upset about the whole Arnolf thing and Lambert situation. And others say that he just died of old age because he was 80. We'll never know, but it is like a little bit sus that he dies four months later. So, I don't know. Do with that information what you will. And Arnolf is like, whatever. I'm king now, so it's fine. Uh, Elect your new pope. So the new pope is elected. So if you hadn't read the title of this episode, you'd probably think that our story with Formosa would be over. He's done. He's dead. How could the story go on? But nay, nay, dear one. Things, things are about to get real, real weird. Formosa is dead, right? And that should have been the end of this story. But hate, hate lingers long after the dead are gone. And the Pope elected after Formosa was Boniface, which is a hilarious name. Boniface the Sixth. There were apparently five other guys named Boniface before him. <laughs> but poor Boniface the Sixth was pretty unlucky because he was only Pope for 15 days. And some say that he died of gout, and others say that he was assassinated to make room for the next Pope, who would be yet another Stephen. Pope Stephen the Sixth. And here's the thing about Pope Stephen, okay? Pope Stephen the Sixth. He was big time political friends with Guy the Third and Lambert and the whole fam bam. And Stephen the Sixth was also kind of off his rocker. Okay? We're not Stephen fans because this little fella is a two timer. I mean, we're not really fans of anybody in this episode. There's like no good no good guys in this episode really. So yeah, we particularly don't like Stephen. Stephen the Sixth, okay? Not a big fan. So he used to be a follower of Formosus and he was team Arnolf, at least on the outside. But as soon as Arnolf left the city of Rome after being crowned king of Italy, Stephen VI was like, JK, I'm on team Lambert. And as soon as Arnolf was gone, Lambert had his dudes move into the holy city and demanded that the actions of Formosus be publicly tried and condemned. Formosus needed to be shamed and his popiness needed to be taken away from him. But Formosus was dead and had been for a few months at this point. However, this was not a problem for Stephen VI. And he said, gotcha, Lambert. Don't worry about it. And in early 897, Pope Stephen V and Lambert, King Lambert at this point, ordered that Formosus's corpse be dug up and brought to San Giovanni to be tried for his sins. The trial was an official papal synod. It's called the Cadaver Synod. And synod just means like a gathering of clergy, like all of the clergy people get together and like have a meeting. In this case, it's a trial. All the cardinals all the bishops and all the other ecclesiastical dignitaries were in full attendance of this trial. And that included the corpse of the former Pope Formosus. But they didn't just take him out of the ground and like set him somewhere. Nay, nay. They put him in full popey attire with his hat and robes and rings and accoutrements that he would have worn during his tenure as Pope. And they propped him up in a chair in the middle of 
the room to be tried. And I'm sure you're thinking, TK, this must have been for ceremonial purposes only. Surely, right? They didn't do anything else with poor Formosus' corpse, did they? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to tell you that they did. There's more. There is more. After dressing up Formosus' corpse and setting it up in the room, Stephen appointed a deacon to crouch down behind Formosus's chair and answer the questions Stephen asked as if he were Formosus. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I can't. Okay. Stephen went in on Formosus's corpse, like yelling and screaming and pointing fingers and asking questions like, being Bishop of Porto, why did you, with great ambition, usurp the see of the apostle? Basically, he was like, why were you trying to be Pope when you were just like a lowly bishop, my guy? And he was yelling this, yelling this at the corpse of Formosus. And I just... I cannot help but picture this room full of grown men watching another grown man, the head, not, only, not just any grown man, the head of the Catholic freaking church just lay into this corpse dressed up in his pope gear with another grown man crouched behind the dead pope answering as if he were said dead pope. Humans are wild. Humans are absolutely wild. Like the saying truth is stranger than fiction is for real because who could make that up? <laughs> who could possibly make that up? I digress. Good goodness gracious. <laughs> I got to take a moment. And this whole spectacle was not a short event. No, no. It lasted for hours. It was an hours long trial. And they finally, at the end, determined that Formosus was indeed guilty and therefore would be stripped of his popeliness. And when I mean stripped, I mean they literally, like in the courtroom, took off his fancy pope garb, his holy vestments, his rings, his hat, his other popely things, and... They cut off three of his fingers that he used for like consecrating things and blessing things. Three fingers as if he was getting a lot of use out of them as a dead guy. Like, but whatever. You do you, Stephen. And it didn't end there. Formosus' body was then dressed in common clothes and buried unceremoniously in a pauper's grave. But that wasn't enough for Stephen. Nay, nay. He needed more. He had Formosus's body dug up again. Again. A second time he had Formosus's body dug up. And he had the corpse thrown in the river Tiber. Stephen. Stephen. Oh my God. Oh my, oh my, that, that seems excessive. It was a lot. And we are not the only ones that think that. It seemed that uh, old Stephen had gone a bit too far for some people. And only a few months later, after the cadaver synod, Stephen VI was imprisoned and then strangled to death in jail another dead pope and i have lost count at this point of how many popes have died that was a lot for the catholic church and two years later pope john the ninth reinstated pope formosus and banned further trials for dead popes which feels like something one human should never have to say to another group of humans like hey don't put dead people on trial. Yet, here we are, and that's it. And now, my friend, you cannot unknow the story of the dead pope trial. 
We have come to our final thought, dear one. And all I have to say is humans are wild. Bananas. Just Stephen. No. No. Was there not one person who was like, listen, Steve, Steve, I think this is a bit much. Like, why not just make an announcement, send out a proclamation or whatever, being like, Formosa was bad. Nah, nobody ever do that again. I, I feel like uh, holding a trial for dead people is not a good look, right? Right. Was there not a single person who said that? That is my question. That is the question of the ages. Anyways, <laughs> so for our final thought, I thought <laughs> I would tell you about the myth of the fisherman. So after Formosus' body was thrown into the river, sometime later, some sources say a few days, others say two years, a fisherman found Formosus' body and brought it to Rome and was like, hey, uh, I think this dead Pope guy, it, are, you, are you looking for him? And uh, Pope John the Ninth was like, yes. Thank you so much. That was so sweet of you for bringing him back. Uh, we'll give him a burial with full Christian honors. But another story says the same thing happened, but a monk did it and not some fisher guy. And we will never know. We will never know. But what we do know is that whether it was really Formosus' body or a stand-in or absolutely nothing. In 897, Formosus was given a full Christian burial with honors that befit a pope and was finally laid to rest in St. Peter's Basilica where he remains to this day. Well, dear one, we have come to the end of our episode. It was weird. It was really weird, wasn't it? But so interesting. When I first heard it, I was like, there's no way. This is not real. Uh, and then when I confirmed it, it was real. I had to tell you about it. So I hope you enjoyed that soiree into the weird, weird world of the Catholic Church. And if you did, please consider sharing it to your other history BFF or somebody who you think would benefit from listening to this insanity. <laughs> Word of mouth is a super helpful way to support the podcast. You can also support the podcast in other ways by writing a rating or review, joining Patreon, getting some sweet, sweet merch, or you could go the free 99 way and share for the love of history on your social media platform. Whichever you do, thank you so much for being here. Your support means so much to me and I really do mean that. And because I care about you, please go do something nice for yourself. Do something that makes you happy and most importantly, don't forget to drink your water, you dehydrated beam of sunshine. I will see you in the next episode where we talk about the Sorceress Queen. Okay, see you later. Love you, bye. We're done. Okay, everything's ready. Everything's set. Hopefully we're good. It's okay to be nervous when we do things, even though we enjoy them. It's okay to be nervous when we do things, even when we enjoy them. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, you gotta stop right now. Okay. <laughs>